Anytime we feel stuck, there's, there's a, a larger context that's filled with healing solutions. There is a higher perspective that we can find. Hi everybody, I'm Melanie Wahlberg and I'm gonna be speaking today about giving freely of ourselves. You know, what that, what that feels like, what that means, and how we all gain. This has been a surprisingly beneficial topic for me to consider recently. I mean, even as, as recently as three years ago, I probably couldn't have given this talk. I hadn't made the connection yet. Sure, I knew that mm, giving my time or contributing to a project or things like that could be a benefit to others. But I didn't realize what a reliable way forward it is for the giver, too especially when we feel like we need some progress. There is such good stuff on the other side of stepping up to the plate a little bit more. I'm a practitioner of Christian science, and that means that the ideas that I talk about today are informed by my study and practice of Christian science. And I'll be talking more all throughout about this universal healing science. But for now, I'll just say that the teachings of Christian science have shown me that when giving is God-impelled, you know, when the impulsion to give of ourselves comes from something higher than ourselves, it brings harmony and joy and capability and even health, even physical well-being. And in the process, we discover that we have not lost anything good at all. Now, the world doesn't necessarily know this. Uh, if you feel stuck, for example, um, maybe you just went through a breakup or lost your job, you don't feel well. Um, if you feel stuck and you Google a response, you know, you go online to find an answer to what you're going through, the internet is not going to advocate for finding more within yourself and giving or, or some type of sacrifice that way. But that God-based way forward that's available to anybody has changed my life. And if the ideas that I share today can help you make that discovery more quickly than I did, sooner than I did, I'll be thrilled. So I'm going to start with a story. And it's about a guy who, kind of reluctantly at first, found it within himself to give freely. And then how he and everybody gained so this kid was in high school, he was a junior, I think, and had struggled for several days with a swollen face and sore jaw, sore mouth. Uh, his wisdom teeth were coming in, but not in a comfortable way. In fact, he'd been unable to eat properly for a while and was getting by on smoothies and juice and ice cream and stuff like that. And was being very stoic. He didn't want any help from anybody, especially his parents. He was gonna get through this by himself. Now, this kid had had some success, some experience at least, turning to God, turning to prayer, especially when things were difficult, and finding healing. His parents were Christian scientists, and so this was what their family did. And so one evening when the discomfort was pretty noticeable, he went up to his room to think about how he wanted to go forward. And he could hear the whole family downstairs having dinner together, and he thought, okay, no more tough guy. I'm reaching out for some help. And so he called a practitioner of Christian science, not, not me, but somebody like me, whose full-time job is taking prayer requests and then responding with healing and with Christian science treatment. The prayer aspect of Christian science treatment does not have a physical element to it. There's no laying of hands or, or touching or anything like that. It's communing with God. It's communing with God in a way that stirs something new in us and that lines our thought up with truth, with, with God. And then that new outlook, which shows you reality, necessarily transforms your experience. That was just the type of thing this kid was looking for. So the practitioner agreed to pray for him, and then the two of them just chatted a little bit, and he brought up, that he was in the middle of buying a new motorcycle. Really excited about this, really proud of the bike that he'd picked out. 
excited about this new chapter of freedom and independence and, and manhood. His parents were not so excited. They were concerned about his safety. He was only 16. Well, the practitioner just said one thing to him. She said, hmm, is, is getting the motorcycle right now worth a conflict with your parents? Not get the bike as soon as possible? Okay, that was a new idea to him. But you know, I think something in their conversation, maybe something in this practitioner's prayers earlier in the day had softened his heart or softened his outlook. Because as he started thinking about it, he realized, yeah, this was something he could do. He could wait a year or two, graduate high school, move out, and then buy the, the motorcycle. And he tells me that when he made that decision, he actually felt relieved. So the two of them finish their conversation, he hangs up the phone, and he realizes in that moment that all the symptoms are gone. The swelling that had been distorting his face for days, instantly gone. His teeth felt great. The pain, completely gone. He went downstairs and had a nice meal with his family for the first time in days. Over the next several weeks, his wisdom teeth did come in, naturally and comfortably, normally. He still has them today in good working order. And you know, that motorcycle came along at just the right time too. That decision that he made to do the bigger thing, I mean, he wasn't thinking of himself when he decided not to buy the motorcycle. He was thinking, what's going to honor my parents? What's going to make my household run better? He might not have used those words, but when, when he made that decision to do this bigger thing, he didn't lose anything good at all. It was just the opposite. He gained. He gained relief and joy and a renewed relationship with his parents. I mean, I think they found more mutual respect. I think he gained more maturity and, and sense of manhood in that decision to honor his parents than the bike might have even brought. And he got unexpectedly quick physical healing, dramatic physical healing. I mean, he found that unexpected way forward. Anytime we feel stuck in a situation like his, or it could be different too, I mean, um, feeling depressed, or again, if we went through a breakup or lost our job, anytime we feel like we need progress, what really seems to make a difference, move the needle, is that humility that that kid showed, or even sacrifice. I know the word sacrifice isn't always popular, just bear with me a little bit. Sacrifice can be oddly rewarding, liberating, because it shows us that our, our happiness, our joy, our well-being is not as based on the thing we want or our plan going through as we thought it was. Actually, our joy flows a lot more freely than that. It really comes from contributing, contributing to the good that's going on around us. Anytime we feel stuck, there is a higher perspective that we can find. As the motorcycle guy discovered, there's, there's a, a larger context that's filled with healing solutions. But I can't talk about the larger context or the healing solutions without talking about God. And so that's where I want to go now. I want to talk about God and God's nature and prayer, as we saw, that's such a catalyst for good things. And then I want to talk about Jesus, maybe the world's best example ever of somebody giving freely of himself. And then I have another example to share. And then I want to talk about the science that enables all of this and its discoverer, Mary Baker Eddy. But we'll start with God. My job as a Christian science healer just requires me to look for a deeper understanding of God every day. And I've found that it's really important that we don't relegate God to the role of superhuman that's kind of distant in our everyday lives. If you feel yourself doing that, the Bible is a really good antidote, especially the New Testament, um, because it, it puts forward a view of God as divine love. You know, not a, 
not a superhuman, but a presence. Not something that condemns and judges and withholds, but a presence that, that loves and welcomes and encourages. That's a totally different feeling. We also can think of love as infinite spirit. I really like that. Infinite spirit that animates us and that creates the universe, that works on our behalf. And when you start doing that, when you start thinking of God as divine love or infinite spirit as this presence, you start to realize that, okay, this is the animating intelligence of the universe. You know, the Bible says God is a very present help in trouble. It's God that impels us towards everything that's good and healthy. God helps us discover within ourselves what we're looking for, the joy or harmony or even health and well-being. That's something of the infinite loving presence of God. And I'll probably come back to that as I'm speaking. Once you start thinking along those lines, it's a very natural question then is, what about us and our nature? I mean, obviously, that's something humanity has thought about for, forever. Um, in, in the Old Testament, we're referred to in terms of God in the Hebrew Scriptures. In Psalms, it says, it is God that hath made us, not we ourselves. We are God's people. We are people of divine love. We are people of infinite spirit. That, that gives you something really big to consider. And prayer shows us that, that loving nature, that, um, that God-like nature that we all possess. We're innately kind and wise and capable, capable beyond what we realize. And prayer shows us. I spoke earlier about a guy who found some nice healing when he turned to prayer. What was going on there? How can we do that? There are a lot of ways to pray. But I think one thing that's common to every sincere prayer is just a deep desire to be more aware of God's presence. I mean, that's what we want, to, to feel it. That's really what we want, to feel welcomed by, by divine love. Um, to feel informed by infinite mind, to feel animated by divine spirit. When you have that kind of communion, I mean, when you're truly feeling God's presence, the best prayer is a feeling, you know, and when you feel that presence, you can't help but get a renewed sense of who you are. You know, we realize more of our own spiritual nature, uh, unlimited. And in those moments of, of spiritual discovery, I find that my goals change. And maybe whatever impelled me to pray in the first place, whatever problem or, or desire or worry kind of pushed me into the prayer chair in the first place, now that can kind of take a back seat to the larger ideas that are coming from God. <laughs> you end up praying about something different than you thought you were going to. I mean, and it's bigger. It's bigger and better than you thought. And that kind of transformational prayer starts with simple ideas about God and God's nature, and then us and our nature, and then our agreeing with those ideas. I mean, that's the stuff of prayer. That's the, the mental activity that's going on. And then the, the uplifted outlook that you get from that mental activity isn't something that you're trying to make happen, it's reality. Prayer shows us that larger context of God that includes everybody. Well, let's talk about somebody who consistently lived in that larger context. Well, we all do, really, but this is somebody who was aware of it. You know, somebody who saw humility and moral courage and, and good works as a way of life, as a way of bringing forward everybody, not just himself. You might know I'm talking about Jesus. Because of just his healing work alone, you know, feeding multitudes with a small amount of food or um, curing disease that was considered incurable, even because of just his healing ministry, Jesus stands out as probably the world's best example of somebody giving freely of himself. And that's why I want to talk about him today. Jesus' example and 
especially his teachings, I think, show us the value and the unexpected reward of giving freely of ourselves and show us that we're more capable of it than we realize. He, he showed us what to do. I think sometimes if we feel stuck, you know, again, not feeling well or feel injured or, or just depressed or inadequate or something, we feel like the best thing that we can do is get through the day, you know, coast a little bit. Um, maybe our circumstances will change. Maybe somebody else will do something. Jesus showed us that even in those circumstances, the ball is in our court so much more than we realize. You know, he showed us what to do and that we can do it. There's a tangible way forward and it's about love. It's about stepping up to the plate in new ways. Jesus saw everything in terms of divine love and what love was enabling. And so that impelled him to just want everybody to be as aware as possible or to feel as much as possible this healing presence of divine love from his followers to us today. And there's this great scene where he's talking to his disciples and he tells them that if they're able to love one another, as he did, even when it's difficult, they can find reliable joy. That's so relevant to what we're talking about today. Our joy flows from sharing, from loving, from, from contributing. There are a lot of different ways to do that. We're not all going to wait two years and then buy a motorcycle. You know, that, that was the right way forward for the guy that I was first talking about. But I've found that when we're truly yearning for healing for ourselves or for someone else, and we get quiet, maybe pray in some of the ways that I've talked about already, there often comes a little nudge from divine love telling us a way that we might give more of ourselves. There are lots of ways to do this. Um, and it's individual. For one person, it might be taking on an assignment at work that you didn't think you were ready for. You know, maybe, maybe your boss recognizes that you're ready for it, but you feel inadequate. Giving of yourself, in this case, might mean accepting that assignment and finding it within you to do well and, and discovering that about yourself. It's, it's a blessing for you. Giving more of ourselves could be forgiveness. That is a big one. Maybe there's someone in your past that you feel like has been hurtful um, and you don't even think about them anymore. You've kind of written them off. Giving of ourselves might be remembering them, forgiving them, and even finding ways to support them going forward. That even just talking about that stirs something new in me. That sometimes when we forgive somebody, we are uniquely positioned to give. We're the only one that can give them that. It could also be um, giving of ourselves could be sharing a testimony of healing with a friend that you hardly ever talk about God with. You know, just a no strings attached, joyful story of how spiritual ideas brought progress in your life. That's giving a little bit more. Sometimes giving more of ourselves is actually talking less, letting others have a chance to, to shine and to share. Giving more of ourselves can even be helping somebody else to talk less. That can be kind of delicate. That requires moral courage and humility and knowing that the right circumstances, but helping somebody else talk less can be a big blessing to them and, and to the whole room. All of these ways that I'm talking about giving are ways that we can pray bigger, act bigger, touch humanity, touch the world even, and not be too worried about the return. Let's not think about that too much. Let's just give big. When God nudges us this way, when divine love invites us to experience more of God's qualities and give more of ourselves, it doesn't feel like a chore. You don't think, okay, I'll take on this bigger assignment at work, but this better work, or I'll forgive this person, but they better appreciate it. I mean, you don't feel that way at all. You just feel invited to do something that you could have been doing all along, but, but now you realize how natural it is. 
all these ways of giving that I've talked about come from divine love. And so they bring joy. That's the essence of my message tonight. We're not giving in order to get something from somebody else or from the world. That kind of transactional giving doesn't bring unexpected joy and healing and momentum. You're just kind of doing what the world expects you're going to do. But when we give freely of ourselves, that's when things get interesting. You, it's not that you get something as much as you discover what's already here. You discover the intelligence and the, the joy and the capability and the strength that's always been there. You discover the health even, the well-being. You're finding that larger context of God that includes healing solutions. You see, wow, life is bigger and better than I thought. And I have something to contribute. Who wouldn't want that? And then anything that's unlike God, like an argument with your parents, or a sore jaw, or grief, or illness, anything like that just loses its grip. It's not part of the larger context where we live. It's my understanding that Jesus understood that and, and lived it. In fact, I think this is what Jesus was, was talking about, was teaching about, when he said, I am come that they might have life and that they have it more abundantly. Abundant living isn't about accumulating stuff. It's about discovery. You know, it's, it's discovering the good that, that God has put in us, discovering the good that God is bringing out in us and letting that take center stage in our lives, letting that move us forward to do something good and big in the world, or at least in our corner of the world. My daughter had an experience along these lines. She had just graduated from high school. Um, she was 17 and she accepted an internship on the other side of the country. And she was very excited about it, but pretty early on, she really felt the weight of the seriousness of the work that they were doing in this office. She was the youngest person there. This was her first time away from home. And she wondered if she was really adequate. She wondered if she was up to the task. And then she got hit with pretty acute flu symptoms. Now, at this point, I think it would have felt easier to her to do some of the things that I was talking about earlier, to, to coast, to maybe see if they could give her easier assignments. She didn't have to prove herself. You know, maybe she could stay under the radar and other people would pick up the slack. But this daughter had really had some nice experiences in the past turning to prayer. And so that's what she, she chose to do this time. She, in prayer, got a, a renewed understanding of God's infinite loving presence and of her own innate capacity to do good, her, her own potential, her own godlikeness and intelligence. And that brought her the confidence to kind of shrug off that wet blanket of self-doubt and inadequacy. That felt really good. And then she was able to do the unexpected thing. Instead of going smaller, trying to make her job easier, she dug in and, and found more godlikeness, more potential within herself to actually give more to the internship. And it had immediate results. I mean, the, the, the learning curve just tapered right off. <laughs> she found herself able to do the tasks much more quickly. She learned things more quickly. The flu symptoms went right away, just melted. And she found that she was able to make a substantial contribution in the office and to that internship. She stopped thinking of herself as the little kid there and, and saw herself as just a team player who had a contribution to make, like all the other team players. When she thinks back on that experience now, she doesn't think of the flu. She doesn't think of being the youngest. She thinks of the lasting friendships that she made and all that she learned. She thinks of what she gained. She had a very successful summer finding that abundant living that Christ Jesus talked about. I know that a big part of her healing and progress that summer had to do with praying with ideas that she found in the Bible and in this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. 
by Mary Baker Eddy. This is the textbook of Christian science. And I just, I want to finish up here today talking about this science that enabled everything I've talked about and the textbook and its author, Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy was born in 1821 to a devoutly Christian family, to parents who loved the Bible, who loved and often quoted and read the Bible to their kids. And so Mary and her five siblings just grew up in this atmosphere of debate and Bible reading and church going and prayer. And in all of that, in her youth and young adulthood, she learned something of the healing power of God-centered living. This was new to her. Then as an adult, her own prayers, which had been deepening over the decades, and her understanding of God lifted her out of chronic ill health. And that was a huge game changer for her. Lifted her out of chronic ill health and even healed her of some acute injuries that were thought to be life-threatening. I'm, I'm giving you a lot of information here, telescoping events in her life, but you can tell a lot was going on. And it was during this period that she discovered what she refers to as Christian science. We've scratched the surface of that a little bit. It's an explanation of God's nature and an explanation of our nature as expressions of God. Christian science shows the unbreakable connection that each of us has with divine love. And I've found that practicing Christian science brings a fuller experience of God's presence, an experience that necessarily includes healing for ourselves and, and for those around us. It's really about discovering our potential. I mean, I think that's what the motorcycle kid discovered. That's what my daughter discovered. It's, it's seeing our potential, one person's potential to touch the world. Mary Baker Eddy talks about this in one of her books. There's this passage, and she's speaking rhetorically, where she says, Who should care for everybody? It's enough, they say, to care for a few. But the good done and the love that foresees more to do stimulate philanthropy and are an ever-present reward. I love that. When we find our lives in that loving activity, when we find our lives in that love that foresees more to do, we find that ever-present reward that she's talking about. And it's really joyful. In fact, I have found that in those moments of stepping back a little bit, stepping out of ourselves and seeing what we have to contribute. Those moments, um, they're so empowering and they bring such joy that the, the good feelings kind of eclipse any feeling of needing or wanting something ourselves. It's not that you don't get everything you need because we do and more, but like you've kind of gotten over yourself and, and you're letting divine love impel you forward. And I think in a modest way, the motorcycle kid found that. Um, my daughter found that. Mary Baker Eddy lived that way. We all can. We all can live in a way that we're impelled forward by divine love. Discovering more of what it means to give freely. Again, as I've said, the, the world doesn't necessarily acknowledge this unexpected way forward. But don't be fooled. Even if we feel like we're struggling, we can discover within us all that we have to give. We have so much more within us than we realize. Christ Jesus remains our best example of giving freely of ourselves. We can keep asking ourselves, what would Jesus do? And your own prayers and the ideas you get from reading Science and Health with the Bible will give you everything you need to bless and to be blessed, to give freely and to gain all. Thank you.